Andy Warhol. Don't you just love him? Don't you just hate him? And aren't you just sick of everybody talking about him? Certainly what with nine exhibitions, not to mention endless analysis and discussions, our own included, Warholitis in London has reached saturation point. In New York, however, the tributes have come and gone, and in the wake of all the media hype, what remains are Warhol's children, artists like Jeff Coombs, Heim Stanback, and Peter Halley, who have developed and expanded Warhol's vision and philosophy and turned it into big buck commodity art. But is there more to these young Turks than just making money? Matt Collins went to New York to find out. Andy was dead, but his ashes were kept warm by the hot wind of love and hate. Back in England, the debate was running on lighter fuel. Fuller was at the wheel with a driver's license that expired a century ago. Everywhere else, people were saying that Warhol changed what it means to be an artist. They said after Andy, there were no more rules. So here I was, where it all began, chasing some leads. First stop was the Museum of Modern Art, but everything there ran in a straight line, from Cezanne to Jackson Pollock. After Warhol, everyone had to reinvent art for themselves. I bought a bag of clues. Names like Coons, Halley, Steinbeck popped up like toast. Liberation lies in the realm of the commercial. I was onto something. Most things that are really, uh, really popular are bad. What makes it art um, has to do with the imagination of choice. A tongue on rye and a pickle, please. Let's see if we can make a deal. They carved Andy up between them. Simulationism, Neo Geo, Smart Art, Post Pop, all those labels. And they all came from Andy. It was all here from the willful erosion of the boundaries between avant-garde and kitsch to the questioning of the commodity status of the work of art. Number one in the art parade was Jeff Koons, the artist as pin-up, living in style 30 yards from crack at $6 a hit in the nearest thing to a South Kensington muse that Lower Manhattan has to offer. The last time we met, his art was burning $250,000 holes in the pockets of the art-buying bourgeoisie. This is a unique landmark street in New York, uh, McDougal Alley. And it's really an old, abstract, expressionist haunt. Uh, Jackson Pollock worked on this uh, block, de Kooning, and a lot of very uh, famous abstract expressionist artists. Matt, how do you like your coffee? With some milk? Yes, art was going to be different now, but some art was more different than others. I think that uh, the important thing is just to be able to, uh, to open up new territory and, you know, to try to expand what the possibilities of art may be. Andy embracing the commercial, it, it, I think, is very important because it's about being effective. And in the, the realm of the commercial, the content doesn't matter, only the effectiveness. It could be any product. The moral judgment of that product is really removed at this time. And for art to be able to become uh, a, a, really the strongest communicator, the, the uh, great uh, seducer, the great manipulator, I think at this moment the artist really does have to pull back a little bit from what the moral content uh, may be on the surface. But at this time, with art being so fragile and so weak, and must compete at a very high intensity level against other industries such as the entertainment industry and advertising. The most important thing is really to coordinate itself and uh, pump itself up to manipulate as strongly as it can. So Coons was building a nice home for art in downtown Popularville. Did that mean all Warhol's children wanted to play in that part of town? What about Peter Halley? frequently mentioned in the same breath as Kuhn's, but working in a style a million miles away. His stuff sits comfortably in a fashion glossy, but it looks kind of dry, kind of 60s minimal. But it says here he's thought about Warhol every day for 17 years. Warhol, if you will, let uh, the phenomenon of movie stars wash over him. And in my case, I'm trying to allow the kind of uh, 
repetitive geometric space of our culture uh, to kind of wash over me. And so I use the phrase geometry and the social uh, to uh, tie together the fact that um, these geometric structures um, are so present in the social landscape, in cities, highways, um, telephone systems. They're all based on geometric structures. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, what first occurred to me about that relationship is I imagine the cell as a confining, isolating structure, mm -hmm. kind of like an office cubicle or a car or a, a bed in a hospital ward. You mean a cell like this square could be seen as a cell? Yeah, I see it yeah. architecturally. Yeah. And in fact, it has a kind of a raised surface mm. uh, uh, made of this stuff called Rolotex, which is a, a, a common uh, suburban building material. Yeah. And uh, at first, I began to think of this cell as a kind of uh, isolated or isolating um, structure. Right. But then I began to get interested in how things might uh, enter or leave that cell. Uh, the idea that if you're alone in your apartment, you still have uh, telephone service being piped in or um, uh, electricity or, or even the television. And I became interested in the relationship between these isolated structures uh, and the kind of communicative bands by which things might come into or out of the cells. The structure of the OK, but I still kept thinking, like where that. did Warhol okay. fit into this? Uh, Warhol allows me to see minimalism in a new way. In other words, if you look at Donald Judd through the eyes of uh, Warhol, you no longer see just a formal stacked structure, but you begin to see uh, a structure that's based on uh, mass production or the factory or a repetition of different kinds. It's minimalism misread through pop art, if you will. They were holding all the cards. They'd taken over everything, the fun art and the hard art, the promotion, the talk, even the art history. And there was no one to tell them otherwise, or was there? I took a cab to see Booklow, Benjamin Booklow. He was an art historian, a critic, and a card-carrying radical. He'd been living in New York for years. A lot of people didn't like what Booklow said about art, but they listened, especially when he talked about Warhol. He had a Richter on the wall, and I got the impression he thought Andy was kind of important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think he is the first artist of the post-war situation that accomplishes the fusion between the traditionally ghettoized avant-garde and the institutionalized culture industry, and he accomplishes that in such a programmatic fashion that his consequences are not quite uh, understood. Right. Um, um, you mean its consequences in terms of whether it's a good or bad thing? Absolutely. But certainly the consequences are uh, irreversible. I don't. So Andy gatecrashed the high art party and made it swing. And the new blood, surely they were all up there too, keeping the neighbors awake. <clears throat> Without being too conservative about it, one could say that Warhol is a dwarf standing on the shoulders of Duchamp. And uh, Steinbeck and Halley and Koons are dwarfs that are standing on the shoulders of the dwarf Warhol. And what they have done, as far as I can see, is that they have taken up residency in the spaces that Warhol has opened. And those spaces are rather decrepit as it is. That is, it's still a different thing between opening up a space and taking up residency in a space. And mm. uh, if Warhol was the last of the artists to uh, perform in those decrepit spaces between high culture and the culture industry, yeah. they have transformed those opportunities into fairly well-established practices. I tried to put the pieces together, but they didn't fit. Booklow had told me that while Andy tossed the bourgeois value system into the blender, the new guys had emptied it out into nice, clean glasses and were selling off the radical as a harmless cocktail. I had to clear my head. I had to see more art. Steinbeck, written off by Booklow, was said to go a step further than Warhol. He didn't just mechanically reproduce the everyday, he ripped the ready-made from the very guts of our society, the department store, and shoved it on a paradigm, or what we would call a shelf. I took the subway out to Quay Street and West in Brooklyn to see what it was all about. It's about our relationship to objects, the way they are placed, uh, the whole ritual of using them, uh, their functions, 
uh, the different purposes, the uh, symbolic meanings. The idea is to somehow uh, reference uh, this object with something that would, how could I say, bring out the resonances and things are juxtaposed side by side on the same level and immediately one perceives that there must be some kind of an equation between them even when some of the choices are not uh, deliberately, consciously calculated and involve uh, a, a process that accepts the notion of chance. What exactly are we looking at here? We're looking at three teddy bears, uh, obviously with, with two identities. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the para bears, which are military, marine type mm. teddy bears, and uh, you have this little black S&M teddy bear. Is that for an S&M family? Uh, possibly, yes. There were uh, other members of the family, mm. and uh, uh, this uh, fellow got uh, separated. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. He, he, was, he was adopted by para bears. Yeah. Right. So all the works, in a way, involve a kind of narrative reading. I wouldn't say narrative, necessarily. Yeah. I would sooner say metonymical. Mm -hmm. um, in what, what, the sense you were referring yeah. before to the fact that the, the black repeats here. Mm. But what's interesting here is that, again, hats are a very strong symbol of identity of a, a person's personality. Mm. And, uh, these guys have their hats on, and they're black, and this character is black. That's his identity, just black mm. teddy bear. Mm. So you have a kind of a, a reading of difference and mm. similarity, mm. and that's something that I play things off of. I could see uh, now that, often. like Warhol, Steinbeck's work had portraiture, pop, humor, and immediacy, and beneath the surface, complicated structures and abstract meaning. It says here on page 51, but almost every journalist never wants to know what you really think. They just want the answers that fit the questions, that fit the story they want to write. And their idea usually is that you shouldn't let your own personality butt in on the article they're writing about you, or else they'll really hate you for sure for giving them more work. One thing that uh, Warhol did, and uh, John Lennon did, and uh, Bob Dylan did, uh, which I think is is as crucial as any other aspect of uh, each of their work uh, was the way they treated the media. Mm. And to me, uh, the media has become a um, overwhelmingly powerful phenomenon in contemporary life. Mm. And I, I think there's only one way to uh, transcend the power of the media, and that's through humor. And uh, I myself am not that good at it. I, I, I guess I'm not that funny. Page 130 of Halley's Collected Essays. Today, children sit for hours fascinated by the day-glow geometric displays of video games. As adults, we finally gain access to participation in our cybernetic hyperreal with its charge cards, telephone answering machines and professional hierarchies. Today, we can play the corporate game, the entrepreneurial game, the investment game or even the art game. So these artists weren't just successful now, they had something to say about now. Didn't Bookclaw just want the good old days when Radical was Radical? Wasn't he just stuck in a time warp? I've heard that all the time, so I'm not in any way surprised to hear it one more time. And I uh, would say, yes, of course, these are the artists, or some of the artists of the 80s. Mm -hmm. and, but I would modify it slightly by saying, these are the artists of the 80s that are most visible. The fact of high visibility in the art scene is not necessarily the guarantee about the relevance of the work. I don't know. I mean, I haven't done my new work yet. Don't yeah. artists like Coons feel threatened by heavyweights like Booklow, who throw ideas well. around like grenades yeah, in a know, bad boy's I, playpen? And, uh, these people really don't embrace the radical. Uh, what my work is about, okay, is about trying to increase the power base of art that it tries to be a, the great manipulator, the great seducer, the one really in charge of all propaganda form, the great vehicle. Now, that's what it's about. It's not involved. The dialogue of consumerism is only on trying to meet needs and desires and 
uh, to be able to have a political platform mm -hmm. on a certain serious level. It's not the dialogue that they're interested in, in consumerism. Kuhn's extraordinary statements are, uh, politically speaking, the perspective of a social fascist, because it's clearly not the question of art to increase its power over the people. Mm. Um, Warhol never talked like this. That's not Warhol's concern. Warhol was really, in the early 60s uh, or mid-60s, uh, involved in that kind of popularism uh, that was typical of that period, mm. uh, which is a popularism or a populism that clearly is not possible in the late 80s. Which is a more elitist age. Yes, when we clearly know that the only venture uh, that keeps uh, contemporary art production uh, visible is, of course, uh, its function as a luxury good in an extremely specialized market and an extremely specialized field of speculation and investment. The words were playing pinball in my skull. I needed a new perspective. Someone out there who thought art was about looking, not just talking. I found it in Central Park. Years ago, Pincus Witten was an outtake from Warhol's movie, 13 Most Beautiful Boys. Now, like Bucklow, he was an art historian and respected writer. The significance of Kuhn's may be something about the art world, but the significance of Kuhn for me is how terrific the objects are. That Kuhn's is interesting to me, not because he, in some sense, is, is bringing into play a whole range of fascinating discussions, which, which he does. But I think the Brancusi bunny is a terrific sculpture. I mean, it's one of the, you know, it's the, it's the emblematic sculpture of the sort of later 80s. I would love to own that sculpture if I owned a sculpture. I mean, I think it's terrific. And I, that's what I'd like to say about Andy's work. It's terrific in and of itself, not in terms of some kind of relativistic yeah. universe which yeah. gives it quality, which gives it standing or quality, but yeah. in and of itself in a kind of absolute platonic universe. And that's a different kind of statement. Right. And it's the statement that I would like to begin making in favor of certain of Kuhn's work and certain of Halley's work are in themselves terrific, terrific to look at, terrific to see one's reflection in, terrific to touch, terrific to fantasize possession. That's what I'm trying to get to. The actual material presences of these things are in themselves terrific. And they're not interesting because they somehow embody social discourse. I had to know, did something happen back there in the 60s? Something that was bigger than all of us? One of the things that's changed is that art itself, in some sense, has become a kind of uh, spectator sport. In that sense, that there's a lot of talk about art particularly in terms of its relationship to money. Yeah. See, the talk is not necessarily about art it's about art and money, or art and society, um, in the degree that art, for example, has generated uh, immense amounts of money. Two blocks away and 50 floors up the Trump Tower was Money and Art Made Flesh, art consultant Jeffrey Deitch, who advised rich art collectors what to buy and found new markets for the avant-garde, markets like Japan, ripe for an artist like Jeff Koons. I'm working with Fumio Nanjo, one of the most interesting younger art critics there, to put together a Jeff Koons exhibition. Uh, we don't want to do it in a traditional gallery or museum. We're looking for a hybrid space that's maybe part cafe, restaurant, part exhibition space, uh, some, a place where a lot of people will see it, not just the small art world that's already there. If art was only about what we see in consumer culture, it probably wouldn't be that effective as art. Uh, the genius of these artists is that they can integrate the art tradition, the mainstream of the art tradition, with this whole new element in our life, which is this consumer media culture. In Deitch's world, the supermarket of art, the lines between doing it, selling it, and buying it get blurred with the action more and more on the checkouts. This will get close to the $4 million price for the Maryland. Yes, I don't, we're not expecting that much. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't think that uh, Liz commands as high a price as Marilyn these days. Well, she, she is still around to promote herself, so may, maybe she will have a stake in raising the value. Art is written about on the front page of the Times of London or the New York Times, not because, let's say, Jasper Johns did a great exhibition. It's written about because a Jasper Johns sold for $17 million. 
Jasper Johns we're estimating somewhere between six and eight million dollars and the Rothko somewhere in the region of two million dollars I think. Remember a few years ago I bought another Jasper Johns double flag in a, a vertical configuration. For half the price? Much less than half the price. And a bigger picture too. <laughs> yes. The whole market issue is so much about how art is perceived today by the broad public and for an artist like Jeff Koons, this is something to be analyzed, dissected, addressed. Your, your estimates are all very reasonable. We try to keep them that way. There's no point in scaring people away with high estimates. I know I'm often accused of being complicit with the structures that uh, I describe. And uh, to a large extent, I think it's important for any artist to remain emotionally or uh, psychologically flexible. To my mind, an artist who said that they uh, hate every aspect of uh, contemporary capitalist culture uh, would no longer be able to make art. Uh, they would already have decided in advance what their work was going to be about. I think that it's good that works of art go for a high price because it just means that one is being taken very, very seriously at that level. And uh, the ideas are really being discussed and decisions are being made on a very intelligent basis. You know, they, they remind me of uh, Andy Warhol's collection of uh, cookie, jars. cookie jars and bric-a-brac. Right. And right. Which, um, in a way, that must, that's perhaps the strongest aspect of, Warhol, of, of the um, Warhol's art that your work really relates to. It's actually uh, his collection, even, yeah. more than his art. Yeah. Let me show you something else. Mm -hmm. You know what this is? That's a walking pecker. It was time to pack up and leave. I came here looking for answers, but all I found was more questions. At least it wasn't the old question, but is it art? Still the favorite on the critics' jukebox back home. Here, they weren't only talking about art, they were talking about a new world, one that was in part created by Andy Warhol, because Warhol took the real and made it into art, and now neither of them would ever be the same again.